Well, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to Baker and Bloom's parent talk today. I will be sharing on the big decision about international versus boarding school. Um, thank you also for those of you who submitted questions beforehand. Um, I'll introduce with a brief introduction, self-introduction, and then um, we'll dive right in and analyze these two choices and pathways. So my name is Renee Bowie. I'm the founder of Baker and Bloom, which is the K through 12 education center. Um, we're located in Wan Chai and normally this would be in normal times, this would be a live event, but there are advantages to doing it through Zoom. And it's great that we get to talk to so many of you uh, who probably wouldn't be able to make it in person. Um, so Baker and Bloom's focus is actually on creativity and love of learning. So I founded Baker and Bloom eight years ago. And since then, we've grown from being secondary focused to K through 12. Uh, and we offer a whole range of classes, as well as coaching for projects and internships. And of course, independent college and boarding school um, counseling and missions counseling. Um, last year, I also founded a school called Bloom KKCA Academy, uh, and I'm the head of school there as well. So that's a primary school. And um, I think in the process of designing this, it's a bilingual school of innovation. And in the process of designing the school, I learned a lot more about schools around the world and many different systems um, of both public and private schools and how schools have been evolving in the face of changes around the world and a lot of technological disruption. So um, even though this is not the focus of today's talk, I think that that's something that should be probably in the back of everyone one's mind, how these two pathways might prepare your child best for the future that they will face. Um, I went to school, oh, I'll tell you about that a bit later as it's relevant. Um, so in terms of my own professional background, uh, I started teaching in the US. Um, and then after getting my PGD in Hong Kong, uh, I taught at ISF Academy. Um, and then, so there I was an IB, uh, MYP and diploma teacher. Um, and then subsequently, um, as I said, I launched Baker and Bloom um, and focused on what education can be outside of school. And sort of going full circle, I'm now returning to the world of school. Um, and it's really, it's really been a very fascinating journey. Um, and I think that as someone who is not only a teacher now, but also having um, advised a lot of students from many different types of schools through their educational journey, uh, I realized that diversity is very important. And so this topic today, I think is definitely not about which one is better in general, but about what's best for you and your child. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, address some of that. So, um, I actually went to a local school, Marymount, uh, in Happy Valley for a primary school up to form one. And uh, I, I look at that and smile because yesterday I just had dinner with my primary three teacher, Ms. Mann, whom I haven't seen in 20 years uh, and is retiring. So we, we, we went out um, for dinner with her and it was so lovely. And uh, it just reminded me what a wonderful education I had in my primary years. Uh, it wasn't too intense. It was academic. Um, my peers all did very well in terms of both their college destinations ultimately, as well as their careers. Um, but our childhood was actually quite test-free up to grade four. I know that that is no longer the case though in local schools, but I do wanna say that um, as someone who went through local school, which was still pretty rigorous and we, we had dictations and all of that, um, the exams, I still think that there's a lot that local schools have to offer, but that's a whole other talk um, that would be like local versus international versus boarding. Um, but if you do have questions about local versus international, uh, we'll probably do a talk on that another time as well. Um, so then after grade seven or form one, uh, I switched to Hong Kong International School. So my brother did something very similar. He went from Wa Yin, Wa Yan um, College to um, Hong Kong International School in grade seven. And um, that was that was a great bridge for me because subsequently I went to boarding school in the US. Uh, and I think my parents probably had that path in mind um, quite early on, although they didn't really discuss boarding school with us when we were growing up. So we didn't actually know that we would go abroad. Um, and I think that HKIS was a great two years, middle school year, and then also subsequently uh, high school. I did a year of high school. And so I can talk to people about when to transfer from um, 
boarding school and went to apply from international school to boarding school because I applied as a grade 10 student. And I work with a lot of kids, most of them who apply in grade eight, that's more common. These days, it's also common to switch in grade nine and then repeat grade nine. So we can talk a bit about the pros and cons of that as well. Um, and then international schools versus boarding school, we will be comparing different facets, but I think that um, the timing also makes a difference. So in my case, which I think um, sort of this pathway uh, is quite typical in the sense of going to primary school in a more local environment, switching somewhere in upper elementary or middle school, and then going to high school in a boarding school. If you go to boarding school in the UK, that boarding school part might occur a bit earlier uh, with 11 plus and 13 plus. So after boarding school in the US, um, I went to college in the US, I did graduate school in the UK, and then I came back to Hong Kong. And I have St. Paul's Quad here, not because I repeated primary school, but because I did my uh, practicum there and I taught in Saint, at St. Saint Paul's Coed. Um, and so that was quite interesting because it was sort of as an adult going back to the local school system uh, and having left Hong Kong for a long time, uh, entering the classroom again and looking at the culture. Um, that was really a very um, eye-opening experience for me. And also, especially since I was the teacher, um, interacting with the students and figuring out what they were like um, was sort of my first reconnection with Hong Kong schools. And then I taught at ISF Academy, as I mentioned, which back then was one of the first bilingual IB programs. Um, and so that was another insight because uh, into the scene because they are a different category of schools. And I'll talk about that um, when I analyze the international schools offerings in Hong Kong. Baker and Bloom itself, um, we have students from all over Hong Kong, many different types of schools, local schools, international schools, and ESF, uh, as well as many students who then stay on with us after they get into boarding school or come to us while they're at boarding school um, for a range of subjects. And most of all, I think for that personalized attention, whether it's a kindergarten child who's like, you know, bit lacking in confidence and um, wants to learn how to read independently, or someone who's in grade five who loves creative writing and really needs someone who shares their passion to encourage them to write more, um, all the way to people in high school who are doing research projects uh, and really want people who are subject experts. Um, so that's the whole journey. But we also do a lot of admissions uh, work. And so for some students, they are um, our boarding school um, students and we work with them to choose schools uh, and work on how to make them, how to present them, uh, how to help them make good choices about their extracurriculars and uh, even to decide whether they should go or to stay. Uh, same for universities, although the uh, American system is slightly more complicated, um, by and large, it involves very similar types of strategic planning, as well as personal mentoring. Uh, and for us, I think I'm, I speak on behalf of myself and our two other counselors, um, especially Ms. Karen Kwok, who has been with us for a number of years already. It's really about um, what difference we can make in that individual child's life. So I hope that today, um, what I have to share with you, while a lot of it is like facts and figures, um, I hope that it also, you remember that when it comes down to it, what we're trying to do if we work together is actually guide you through choices um, that in a very personalized way, and to also be there to help your child become a more independent student so that they can navigate these choices themselves. Um, okay, so the overview of today's sharing will be first a comparison uh, between international and boarding um, schools, then some factors to consider when choosing between the two, uh, and then I'll give some examples of curriculum differences, cur curricular differences, and then talk about uh, how to think about when to make the transition if you plan to go to boarding schools or, or actually from the local to the international stream, uh, and then how college admissions come into play. Um, let's see, okay, so first, international schools. Here are some basic facts, which um, are provided actually by the EDB. Um, the number of primary schools in Hong Kong, and um, including primary come secondary international schools and secondary schools. Um, so that might be a bit surprising to some of you because maybe um, you thought that there were more schools than there might be, um, but it's 
the numbers are actually um, not that high. Although in the past few years, there have been a rapid growth of new international schools and new private schools. Uh, and there are private schools that are non-local. So they may not be included in the international school category, but their curriculum might be international. So that's something to think about as well. And um, I'm just showing this very quickly because you can actually access this on the EDB website yourself if, to dive more deeply into it. But you can see that the percentage of non-local school kids, uh, students are about 70%. Um, right now, uh, versus 30%. And that refers more to their passport than to their actual background. That number, of course, during uh, after the fifth wave will have changed with the exodus of a lot of students um, who are from other countries. Um, and then, oh, sorry. Here we go. Uh, I'd like to mention that we also have a very uh, interesting category of schools, a different category of school called the PIS, Private Independent Schools. Um, and these are some schools that have uh, that might run the IB, but are not categorized as international schools. So if you're looking up schools to apply to, remember to check these out as well. They include schools like International Christian School, ISF, Victoria, Yu Chung, Renaissance, uh, and Discovery. And uh, Choi Ga Yao, Bo Lan Gok Choi Ga Yao. Hong Kong has many schools that offer the IB uh, program. And um, so technically, you're not really entirely an IB school unless you are offering an official program. Um, and the IBO actually comes and accredits your school. So um, for PYP, that's the, there are more schools that offer PYP than any other program. Um, with the middle year program, it's uh, 16 schools. And the diploma program, um, quite a number, 30 schools. Some schools only offer the diploma program. So they may offer IGCSE beforehand or even local school system. Um, before they offer up the option of the diploma program pathway. So you, uh, you can tell from those numbers that the vast majority of international schools in Hong Kong have the IB as their curriculum. So I do want to, uh, I will focus a bit more on that when I, uh, when I compare international versus boarding schools, because, um, and this is more true of the US than the UK, there are fewer US boarding schools that are IB. So that is a starker difference. But if you're thinking the UK, um, there's actually a trend of more schools that traditionally were A-levels that are now considering uh, or have already adopted IB. So for example, Cheltenham Ladies College is now A-levels and IB as well. Um, international schools, what do they offer? So I'll let you read this actually, um, and then I'll dive into a bit more in detail. Okay, so um, something unique about international schools in Hong Kong in particular is that there might be multiple pathways, which is usually less common in boarding schools, because um, and except for UK, and the UK now has that uh, A levels and IB uh, trend, but I wouldn't say it's a it's a uh, the majority of UK boarding schools. So um, this is still a distinct difference, uh, which you may find very appealing. So for example, in Canadian international school, there are two curriculum, one that is the um, Canadian national curriculum and the other that follows the IB. Uh, French international school also has that. Um, and there are also schools locally like that are not international schools, but like DSS schools that offer both the um, DSE as well as IB. Um, and so for many people, that is quite, um, that that's quite appealing because it gives you some time to see whether your child might be suited for the IB. And if they're not, there's another option. Um, competitive, non-transparent admissions, meaning um, the system, the admissions process for boarding schools usually has to be quite explicit and transparent. Although with the UK, it is hard to navigate. It is still quite clear from their website what tests you need to take. And you can take a look at what those tests look like. Um, and it's quite clear what the criteria um, 
are for these schools. But it is a little less transparent in international schools. And each school may have their own system and their own types of tests. Um, and then something also unique to international schools it are debentures and capital levies. So sometimes you really have to read the fine print, go on the website and check out uh, beyond the annual tuition what you might have to pay once you enroll. Uh, and then there are wait lists and wait pools. Wait lists um, are schools that basically it's first come first serve. If you are put on the wait list and a space opens up, then if you're next in line, then the space is the place is yours. With wait pools, uh, which many schools, including like HKS also has, they will have a group of students of a certain cohort, but they will not rank them. Um, Sorry, they will rank them, but not based on order of application. So they may see, oh, maybe we need certain uh, factors to take, we need to take into consideration, like say diversity or specific talents. And if a student brings it, even if they're not literally the next in line, they might um, be accepted first. So that's something to think about um, when you're choosing which schools to apply to for international schools. You can definitely ask their admissions office whether they are wait lists or wait pools. Uh, and then there are these three categories. You can choose schools that are just primary, secondary, or through train. As you saw from the first slide, not many schools are actually full train. And there are only about eight schools, international schools, that are just international schools. So um, something to think about, especially if your child is very young. I know some of the parents here today have uh, maybe people, children in kindergarten, little people in kindergarten. So if you're thinking about that, you do want to know whether school is through train and what system um, curriculums, uh, what curriculum um, streams they offer all the way to secondary. Um, and then this is another unique feature of Hong Kong international schools. They teach Chinese more so than in boarding schools. Um, there are options in terms of having bilingual education and dual streams. Some schools are dual language. So in terms of bilingual education, there's a range. Some are dual language, like they teach everything in every subject in two languages. Um, or even if, it does, if the content doesn't overlap, like it does um, in, say, French international school a bit more, um, it will be repeated in some ways. Both subjects, I mean, all subjects will be addressed in both languages. So an example of that would be uh, IMS, International Montessori School. Um, and then there are schools where they have very strong language programs in both languages. So that's more common. And that's quite a strength, I would say, of staying in international schools in Hong Kong. That strong Chinese foundation, which again, if we're thinking about preparing our children for the future, um, since there are people from Hong Kong and this region being fluent and proficient, at least in Putonghua or in Chinese and in writing and speaking um, is very important. So that might be something to take into account um, as you make this choice, maybe more so than in the past, where six years, sort of like going back to my own journey, six years of a local school would be regarded as sort of sufficient. But these days, some people would prefer to stay longer um, for that connection, not just the language, but also the cultural heritage and sense of identity. Um, International schools are also quite unique in the way in that they offer a lot of excursions and overseas trips uh, and opportunities for experiential learning. Um, definitely boarding schools, both in the US and UK, offer that in the UK, often in Europe, uh, in the US, uh, in different states, and sometimes internationally. But usually it's, uh, it's an option for you to take. And often during breaks, like spring breaks, you might go to England. Uh, like my school had exchanges with Eton, with um, Seven Oaks, um, but it was not a whole school requirement. Um, whereas in international schools, they're usually weeks when the entire school travels. They may go to different places, but it's sort of mandatory. And in a way, it's a wonderful um, requirement to have. Um, that also leads to many opportunities for volunteering and service, um, not only in Hong Kong, but abroad. That also can make your child uh, stand out when it comes to college admissions. And more importantly, I think it's a life experience, which many people look back upon. Even in college, they might not get to do that. Um, I remember our, our school, I went like HKS, had um, trips to Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, New Zealand. I went to Australia in ninth grade um, and really exciting connections that um, the school had developed. So they were really bespoke opportunities. Um, athletics. So if you stay in Hong Kong, you would 
do so for some students because of sports, which maybe sounds a bit odd because there, as I will tell you, there are lots of amazing sports opportunities abroad. But in Hong Kong, you can represent, uh, if you're a Hong Kong citizen, you can represent Hong Kong and compete regionally now uh, and also compete within China. And it's quite a... Um, it's very intense, actually, the level of competition and sports in institute training is also extremely rigorous. But for some people, um, there are sports like fencing that might be um, unique to Hong Kong or well, not unique to Hong Kong, but might not be offered in boarding schools. And so um, you may choose to actually stay for athletic reasons or you may belong already to a league that you are doing very well in and um, probably would do better to stay. Um, multiple opportunities for university destinations. So it's very common in Hong Kong when Karen and I work with students who um, they may want to apply to the US as well as the UK. And these days, perhaps also in mainland China and also in Hong Kong. Um, and that's quite common. I will show you the numbers later, but you'll see that this is less common in both the US and the UK. Um, they're more there to prepare you as prep schools for the universities within their country. Um, so these are some pictures and I'd show them because I want to, I think it's really worth celebrating how amazing it is that Hong Kong as one, one city offers such a range of international schools from like Norwegian international school, Japanese international school to French, to these boarding schools that have been, um, uh, that have franchises and bring some of that British tradition with them to Hong Kong, uh, including a few that are now that offer boarding options as well, like Harrow International. So um, I think that that's something quite special because you get some of the advantages of the boarding experience or the overseas schools culture, as well as the benefits of staying put and being close to home. Um, this is from the HKIS website. You can see that there are opportunities like doing TED Talks um, or volunteering that are super interesting that if you were not in this part of the world, you may not have the opportunity uh, to participate in. And um, this, I wanna share, a lot of international schools now increasingly devote energy, human resources, uh, and curriculum uh, focus to Chinese language and culture. So um, that's something to check out. It's, it's a growing trend. Um, and also one thing to note is that uh, versus local schools, a lot of international schools will teach Chinese in simplified language. So that might be something that you like, and that might be um, a reason to choose international schools as well. Uh, you can see there on the left side under learning that Canadian has the IB stream and the Ontario Secondary School Diploma as well. And uh, in terms of IB, um, since that is the main curriculum that most ESF and most international schools have adopted, I'll say a few words about it. Um, some schools offer the middle year program the MYP, and that covers eight subjects. Um, there are interdisciplinary units that are required. There is a, a project, a personal project at the end of year, um, the fifth year, uh, year 10, which is grade 10, um, which is also required. Um, there are a lot of, there's a huge emphasis on global context and themes that are, um, that are very 21st century. Um, and it gives you a very balanced plate and balanced foundation for secondary school. In grade nine and 10, you can choose six subjects out of eight instead. Um, and then when you move on to the final two years of the diploma program, um, you have a similar approach in that there is that liberal arts field to the IB, uh, which is something that which is very much one of its strengths, the breadth of the IB curriculum, um, which requires students to do three higher level subjects and three standard level subjects uh, across two years. And the subjects are listed here. It has uh, liter literature and language, uh, sorry, language and literature, language acquisition in um, individuals and society, which is like economics, psychology, um, geography, history, that type of humanities and social science subject. And then we have math and arts and sciences. Um, that's something to bear in mind, especially when you compare it to the uh, A-levels, which require only three subjects in most schools. Uh, some students do take on a fourth, perhaps a further math subject, um, but Generally speaking, most schools only require three subjects. Um, and so the depth of the A-levels can be contrasted with the breadth 
of the IB diploma program. The IB is also very much a holistic program. So you can see theory of knowledge, which, which is a kind of philosophy course on knowing uh, what it ways of knowing, what does it mean to know, uh, kind of an epistemology class. And then it has a required extended essay. Um, which is a research paper and um, an emphasis on service. So if you go to an IB program, you can pretty much not worry about the fact uh, whether or not your child will do service. It's a requirement. So creativity, action and activity and service is part of the um, I diploma program. I, I want to just end this section on the international school with a quote from a student of mine. Uh, I just you know, chatted with her recently and asked her how she felt about going to boarding school. Um, and so she she shared quite a bit, and I'm just uh, talking about one aspect of it. Um, she said that academically, it depends on whether you have access to educational enrichment and opportunities. Sorry, this was not, sorry, mixed up. This is a student who stayed and did not go to an international, I mean, a boarding school. Uh, and she had the opportunity to do so, but as you can read from the quote, ultimately she decided not to. So you can take a look at this quote. And I love how she really was very wise in the sense that she was reminding parents that it is very important to give the choice or to have your child involved in making that decision. Um, and because ultimately, even if you convince your child to choose what you would like, uh, they may not be very happy, right? So we, I'd, I'm sure that parents um, care a lot about their child's happiness and also their motivation, right? Uh, if they choose to stay, and they're happy with that choice, there are many opportunities and ways to um, enrich your academic experience even beyond school, um, as she pointed out. And I think one of the questions that came was about how to do that. So I would say that very, um, very briefly, that um, a, in addition to research opportunities that might be just about, say, the TOK, the essay, um, you can also pursue more research papers, right? You can write independent research papers um, that might get published if you submit them to formal publications. Uh, some of the Baker and Bloom students we've worked with have done so. Uh, we also have coaches that work with students to do that, say getting um, a paper published in the Concord Review, which is a peer reviewed history journal. And if you go to an international school, you can still do that, but you may not have time. Um, and then another opportunity would be to do internships in Hong Kong uh, throughout the year. So that's also quite different. And there are certain extracurricular activities that you can do from very young age all the way to your senior year, providing a level of continuity that's harder to find in boarding school, uh, especially because you leave, you leave the school periodically throughout the, uh, throughout the school year on the calendar year. So that's something to think about. And I mentioned sports, so um, squash, fencing, sailing, um, badminton, um, wushu, these are sports that might be unique to Hong Kong and might be reasons to stay. Um, and of course, there in international schools, I should say one cultural difference. It's very common for students in Hong Kong and Asia who are in international schools to have tutors, but very uncommon and in fact not allowed in boarding schools. So that's a very big difference and might affect your choice depending on how independent your child is academically. Okay, so um, a little about boarding school. I'm, in the past, I haven't shared this type of data before, but some people did ask us um, prior to the um, to today's seminar. So I just wanted to give you some numbers. Um, the first two rows show you the average fees for UK boarding schools and the average fees for the US boarding schools. And then I just picked three um, kind of random, but selective um, UK boarding schools and all, all girls, all, all boys, a co-ed one. Um, all three on the uh, US side are co-ed, but one of them is on the West Coast, just as a point of contrast. But you can see the range there. And um, they're also much higher than the average fees in terms of boarding schools. Um, at the end, if people want to hear more about scholarships and financial aid, I'm happy to answer questions there. Right now, I will say that the UK offers um, scholarships that are non-means tested, that are not based on your uh, economic uh, background, but are more about rewarding you for academic achievement, music, arts, uh, even chess. 
um, you can get scholarships for them. And it depends a bit on the school, whether it comes with any reduction in school fees versus bursaries, which are, um, which are financially means tested. And there, there usually is an independent organization to uh, find out whether to verify your economic background. So um, in doubt, I would say that there are more funds in the US than the UK for, for financial aid, which has repercussions in terms of diversity. Okay, uh, I'll also give you a minute to read this list first, since it's very text heavy. And these are features of boarding schools. Okay, so uh, low teacher student ratio. Um, the student teacher ratio in most boarding schools is about one to five or below. And um, for international schools, say CIS, it's about one to eight. So, I mean, it's already very low in international schools, particularly compared to local schools. However, there is still a difference. And I would say that living together with um, faculty, of course, leads to more personal, intense, bonds and relationships. Your um, teachers in boarding school see many facets of you. Uh, the, the college counselor also will know many more aspects of you as well, may even have taught you, um, which is more rare in an international school. And there are also many opportunities to interact uh, in terms of daily life, eating together, and also uh, being part of the dorm. Dorm life is really big, of course. And so it's not just about the classroom ratio, but also the the um, the quality of pastoral care. Um, because it's a boarding school, of course, they they feel that you they are their your parents, your child's parents away, family away from home, home away from home. And so they feel that sense of parental care more strongly than a teacher at an international school would or would be even required or expected to, of course. Um, there's also usually a higher degree of percentage of faculty with advanced degrees. And most critically, you have access to them all the time, um, most of the time. And the many of them offer uh, basically office hours and extra help. So that's the way in which they balance out the fact that you're really not um, supposed to do any type of tutoring uh, while you're in boarding school. Um, and instead, they offer you this opportunity to actually just work with your teacher. And I do think that that makes a big difference in terms of your academic experience. It makes you much more of a self-starter, uh, makes you feel a little bit more pressure, um, but it, it teaches you how to manage your time, how to seek help for yourself. And um, those are definitely some qualities that help you in the long run, especially when it comes to college preparation. Uh, I'll get into the resources and all of that a bit later, but um, there's usually a more diverse offering and very challenging academics, although I have to say, honestly, the IB curriculum is one of the most challenging in the world. So the level of rigor is, it's not the level of rigor that's different. I would say that it's the culture, uh, the intellectual culture, and the, the difference in terms of how that rigor is expressed. Um, it being less consistent in internet uh, in boarding schools, whereas the, in the IB, um, because it's a universally uh, adopted framework implemented in dozens of countries all over the world, it really cannot be something that is um, very um, different and kind of um, esoteric or, or different in from school to school. Whereas boarding schools can have very quirky offerings. Like uh, for example, in Winchester, there's a class called Div and it exposes you to a lot of things like uh, in terms of philosophy and current events. And in the sixth form, it is entirely determined by what your the dong wants to teach, what the teacher wants to teach. And it, that can be based on their own interests. Um, same for the US, there can be electives that are just dependent. Okay, if there's a teacher who loves photography, there might be a particularly um, strong photography department um, versus the IB where the arts curriculum is predetermined with exams and everything, right? With assessments already outlined. Um, there are opportunities for exchange and study abroad, like full year study abroad programs. So that's different from international schools. There are quite a number of kids who choose to spend, say, a year in Europe or a year even in Japan. And that's um, something you can do. And you can also even do a year long independent project, uh, a capstone project. That's very common. Um, 
diverse range of friends. Usually, um, in terms of nationality, boarding schools have um, have students from over 40 countries. And um, in international schools, especially these days, it's about 20 countries or so. And I think it's also different because you're living together. There is that sense of um, really having that opportunity to get to know all the people in your school. So you you may have that diversity in international schools, but you may not get that so big that you may not actually know people from different countries. Um, and the tradition, the community, and a very global network of alumni um, are things that boarding schools are famous for. Uh, and also sort of the Harry Potter experience is something that many children, many young people enjoy. Um, and it's a lifelong connection. I would say that um, boarding schools do a fantastic job of keeping the alumni network very strong and that sense of community. Um, my husband and I both attended St. Paul's. We met there actually, and we both love reading our alumni horai. Uh, even people that we don't know, we just feel that sense of an extended family, um, which I think is quite rare uh, in terms of high school experience. And, and now I want to just do a little bit on um, UK, not versus, but like some things to highlight um, in UK boarding schools and also US. Um, UK boarding schools, I think one of the strengths of uh, the British boarding schools are is the quality of pastoral care because partly because many children might go very young. They may be um, in boarding schools by the age of eight. I think that that has led to a tradition of taking care of lots of kids in a dorm setting um, that has that has made it a very um, holistic experience that's very well thought out, very nurturing. And many people who take their young children to these boarding schools um, leave feeling comfortable and um, feel that they can trust and trust their children to um, perfect strangers uh, to take care of their children because there are systems in place, there's counselors, um, there are tutors, there are uh, things to do in the weekends, even kids who are very young. Um, and there is a good balance usually between day students and boarding school boarding students um, in the younger years. And then when they get older, vast majority of the students are boarding, uh, some up to 90%. Um, but that boarding experience, I think, is one that involves getting to know a lot of adults very well from a young age. And that helps develop social emotional skills and a level of maturity and ability to interact with adults that um, sometimes if you stay in an international school, you may never need to develop. Um, there are also, I, I mean, I think it's quite obvious once you set foot on a campus, but they're really gorgeous, gorgeous grounds. And it's that sense of history as well. Uh, there's often also a relationship with the town nearby. Um, and every school has its unique features based on its grounds. Some schools have rivers near them. And uh, if they have water, they usually have rowing and excellent rowing, like places like Shrewsbury, for example. Um, and same for um, US schools. Some of them have like rowing, like at St. Paul's, it was really big, but some schools don't. But they may have thing, other things uh, like ice hockey and things that are unique to the features of, on the ground. Um, and I do think environment matters. It changes how your child might feel. That connection, I would say, also to nature is very important. And in both the US and UK, you have that. But in the UK, the schools are much older. So you really do, you can smell it in the air, that sense of tradition. Um, and I would say that that um, tradition is important, not just in an ex external exterior way, but also that sense that you are joining a community uh, where there are a lot of people out there who are from your school and that sense of pride. And also every school invites alumni to come back to speak to their students. So that inspiration that they might draw from knowing people who came from their own school, um, who graduated and made a difference in the world and are there who care enough to come back to talk to you. I think that's also something, uh, that sense of uh, permanence, because when people go to boarding schools, they usually stay there. Whereas in international schools, for reasons beyond the control of the child themselves, they may have to leave, right? So there is a more turnover, not just of staff, which 
this year, I think everybody knows, is very painfully felt. But even normally, it's not uncommon to have like a up to a 10 to 20% turnover rate in international schools. Uh, whereas in boarding schools, you, it's much more common to have people who might have gone to boarding schools themselves. They have maybe parents who taught in boarding schools. And after going off to pursue different things, they may come back and settle. And uh, so it's almost a way of life. And um, another wonderful feature would be the the sports the sports opportunities outdoors opportunities offered um there are schools like um that require uh physical activity that might be beyond what a normal school might require like gordonston has this yacht experience and uh expeditions every year uh since the founder kurt han has was the founder of outward bound all the students have um opportunities and requirements to meet in terms of physical challenge. And I think that that's character building. Um, that's something that I think in the Asian education system is not emphasized as much. Sports is uh, an option for people who like it. It's seen as sort of a tonic to the intense academic culture, but it's a requirement in UK and US boarding schools. It's a part of life. Uh, I would say that in the UK, there are, uh, it's a little more balanced in that it's also seen as something to do outside in parallel uh, with your academic development, whereas in the US, it can be very competitive, almost pre-professional. Um, but either way, that I think is a huge advantage because if we're talking about 21st century skills, collaboration, teamwork, all of those skills are put into use in a very fun way um, for, for students who get to participate in sports in boarding schools. Um, there were questions about US UK so I'm making this looks a bit like a contrast but I think it's fair to say that both um, on both sides of the pond you have opportunities for sports for performance for performing arts and stem but these are some slight um, I think uh, emphases. For example, in US boarding schools, I think that there is more thrown into STEM education and innovation. Um, and it's part of the culture of the country as a whole, as a you know uh, more young upstart country, although it kind of isn't anymore. It's still very much a world leader, global leader in STEM innovation. And so um, there is that uh, spirit of, of pioneering um, of doing things that are new, um, which is quite pervasive in the US and is also permeates the um, boarding school culture. So um, my school, for example, had an amazing astronomy center, um, university grade one. There are, there are many schools that have like bee farms, their own farms, um, where kids actually work in. And so that understanding of our relationship to, to nature is very much firsthand. Um, and understand when you study things like environmental science or marine science, it's also amazing to have those opportunities on campus. Um, so resources, right? That's a huge difference between international schools and boarding schools. International schools are very well off, of course, but boarding schools have endowments. And that's something that is, um, especially the US ones. And uh, just for say scholarships, Choate has like 13 to 14 million a year just for scholarships. So you can imagine how much they spend on facilities and programs and faculty, um, which also relates to a point to make. I know that a lot of things I'm covering here, you may vaguely know already or, or know very well, but I do want to point out some differences in terms of the actual experience. You can definitely be involved in theater in an international school. But in a boarding school, you may have a director of theater studies that's actually someone who's produced plays in Broadway or shows in Broadway, who might be um, who might be part of a uh, theater company, and this may be uh, a sabbatical for them. So there are a lot more people who are practicing artists who are who wouldn't be an IB teacher, let me put it that way. Um, harder to find someone who's also both an, a professional and also an IB teacher. So there are more opportunities for that type of instruction uh, when it comes to especially performing arts. And similar to what I said about sports, I think that this huge emphasis on performing arts is a wonderful way of preparing young people for the future because a lot of the skills um, that we're trying to cultivate of creativity, of um, working together, to produce something that can be shared um, of 
in of having depth and deep learning that is experiential um that's learning together and involves collaboration, critical thinking, creativity um, is something that is that nat naturally happens. So even though I would say boarding schools don't market themselves as like future oriented schools, because ultimately they're also about tradition and heritage, um, they also they inherently prepare kids for the future because of that emphasis on character and on uh, sports and extracurriculars, um, as well as performing arts. So I said earlier, pre-professional angle with the um, sports in the US, and that's true from everything from water polo to track and field to hockey, you can be recruited. Uh, those are definitely ways to get into college that are very legitimate. And that also reflects a broader definition of success, I would say, in boarding schools versus international schools. Uh, Hong Kong has really highly ranked uh, diploma program uh, DP students um, and schools. They score very high, um, one of the highest probably in the world. And um, I, I mentioned I taught at St. Paul's Coet. When I left, they had just started the uh, IB DP program. And now they're one of the top uh, in the world and in Hong Kong. However, I would say that IB is much more than the diploma program and also much more than the scores that the highest achieving students can attain. And a school is more than that, right? So the spirit of IB is really much more about being um, global minded, intercultural awareness, holistic development, um, cross-disciplinary learning, all of that may not be reflected on the av by the average score of the diploma program students. So do bear that in mind. And I, I think that there is still more of an emphasis on academic achievement in international schools um, versus the kind of broader view of boarding schools. So another uh, page of numbers. Um, in the US and North America, there are roughly 300 boarding schools. And the average acceptance rate is actually 56%. So it's not that daunting. Um, if you just want to go to a school, I bring this up because sometimes people come and it's not like 300. It's like they think there are three schools worth applying to. But um, actually, there are many schools out there. So if you're looking for um, a more a different type of curriculum um, with more choice and that connection to nature, the diversity of the students, and all of that type of, uh, all the benefits we talked about, facilities and all that. You can get that in other boarding schools that may not be as competitive. Um, it's not that I'm recommending those schools, but I'm just saying that sometimes you might want to look beyond the schools that hear, you hear about all the time. And um, schools with acceptance rates that are below 20%, there are only about 20 of them. And uh, average SSAT score of 87 percentile. Uh, that question I get asked all the time. And of course, you know, it's an average. So there are people who perform below that, there are people who perform above that, but that, there you go. That, that's what the average is. Acceptance rate between 31 to 40 percent, which isn't that low, there are 22 schools. Uh, and then 21 to 30 percent, there are about 17 schools as well. Okay, so factors to consider when you're making the decision, because what I'm here to do today is to share with you some uh, fr a framework and to provide you with some data or uh, maybe perspectives that you uh, hadn't considered before. So, um, ooh, I think, sorry. Before I do that, I apologize. I, I'm, uh, these two slides got switched places. Uh, I wanted to end with a quote. This is a very long one, though, from um, a student in a boarding school um, that's graduated and entered freshman year of college at a top college this year um, that I've known since she was in grade six. So she said, for me, boarding school was a lot more collaborative, which benefited me in terms of diversifying my approaches to problems, solving problems, and gaining stronger peer support. I also just work better and more motivated in group settings. Oops. People say that work at boarding school is easier compared to local and international schools, and I really disagree. The teaching style is very different, and the learning curve depends on how well you can absorb information from discussion-based learning rather than from traditional note-taking lecture-based styles. So this student went straight from a local school to um, boarding school. So she's just comparing it to local school. Compared to one final per semester at her local school, it was a lot just it was a lot just to get used to having graded assignments every week. 
Um, so instead of getting crazily stressed out in the last two weeks, I was probably dealing with a good amount of stress from time to time. But I also thrive under a bit of stress. So this, again, depends. Um, I think that this is worth remembering that um, the continuous assessment can be more stressful for some students and a big adjustment compared to even intense local schools. And um, what this student mentioned, assignments every week, I remember at St. Paul's, we had to write every single day. And there was definitely a 500 word essay every single week, which means um, a lot more um, opportunities to learn how to write. And writing really is a muscle. Um, and if you exercise it, you become stronger in it. And I would say boarding schools do much better in, the, in this specific arena. And it also is one of the biggest struggles for students transferring to boarding schools. Uh, and that's why a lot of people in terms of our work at Baker and Bloom, they do come to work on the writing skills before going to boarding school um, in anticipation of that, since tutoring is not really encouraged or even allowed in some schools. So before you go, having that strong foundation uh, for analytical, critical essays and creative writing is really important. Um, so going back sorry, to the, oops, what happened here? Factors. Okay, so personal factors and academic factors. So think about, uh, okay, there are many things that are hard to determine. Once you decide to go to boarding school, you have no idea what your child's um, academic advisor will be like. You have no idea whether they'll get a single room or a double room, what their roommate might be like. Sometimes people are paired with roommates that make them miserable. And, you know, you may love the school, but your child's experience might be determined by factors beyond your control. But there are many things that you do know, which is what your child is like, and your child can talk to you. So figuring out how your child learns best, whether they do better when they have that um, collaborative opportunities and when they're able to actually take time to go at their own pace, um, or whether they need more structure, which maybe at home you can provide them with, that's something to take into account, how, what, how well they manage their time, uh, how confident they are both academically and social emotionally, because in terms of social adjustment, that's something that um, might be more challenging because it's a different culture um, and everybody is away from home. So there's a lot to get used to. And if you are thinking about college admissions, academics matter a lot, and colleges don't really care whether it took you a while to assimilate and adjust to boarding schools, right? They only look at your transcript and your resume. So you, it, to the degree that your child can be more prepared, um, that really helps them. And if you feel that they really are not ready, then it's best not to push them to go. The, their desire for independence. Sometimes Karen and I, in the uh, intro meetings, we ask kids, do you want to go? And many of them don't even know. Right. Or they might want to go, but they can't say why. And it's really because all their friends are going. So those are not excellent reasons for for pushing them to do something that's quite a dramatic change. And it's really encouraged to have your child have more conversations with people who've been to boarding schools uh, or if they're lucky enough to go to summer school program. That makes a big difference. And like with my student who stayed at an international school, you may dis discover that your child doesn't want to go. And it also helps with the choice of boarding school. Um, having experience living abroad, you can think about that in terms of shorter camps and the family context. Sometimes people have family in specific countries, so that might determine where they apply to. Um, I'll get into the academic focus later on, So, but that's just something to think about as well, um, that some students might be very well suited to the IB. Uh, they may be very well rounded uh, and really enjoy the, the collaborative ways of learning that are specific to the IB and the great emphasis on presentations. Um, I would say that maybe a slight difference between international school and uh, boarding school would be there are more presentations in international schools and there are more discussions and debates in boarding schools. Um, and of course, if they're unique strengths, like if they want to study certain things, um, 
and may not be offered abroad, uh, including certain languages. And also, as I said before, extracurricular interests. So if they're already part of a symphony here. I've had students enter like top boarding school, but then they couldn't get first violin. And in Hong Kong, they were in a very good, um, or uh, sorry, or orchestra. So why, why uh, make that switch if music is so important to the child? So um, that's something to pay attention to. Um, in terms of the academic choices, with boarding schools, you have that emphasis I was talking about previously. Um, for example, you have like centers of innovation and AI. Um, when it comes to music, it goes beyond um, say AP, A levels or IB music. There's like digital music, songwriting, um, design, animation, uh, all types of um, opportunities to participate in STEM robotics competition. And very importantly, many boarding schools now offer uh, research scholarships or research programs that are signature programs. So look, look up signature programs when you compare boarding schools, because they will connect you to a professor in college or the teachers uh, in the boarding school will guide the student towards um, towards a research project. Uh, and that can be, that, that can look very good, obviously on your resume for college admissions. I think I have to move much faster because we, we've we actually um, close to 1230 already. So um, in these schools, there are opportunities for uh, performance in like Carnegie Hall, um, in their own, like this is the Choate's Paul Mellon Arts Center. Um, there are classes like, even like clowning and comedy um, in many schools, like. If they have ballet, um, ballet companies might come to recruit from the ballet company. And if they have theater, they might also have technical theater. So um, learning how to operate um, the design and the production and the sets might be a whole crew and an extracurricular activity that's different from what international schools might offer, which would, could be drama. The facilities and the program are very impressive in um, the top boarding schools. And sometimes people also ask like, is it worth that effort to apply to these competitive boarding schools? Because it, it is quite a, a arduous process. Um, and of course you can see from the tuition, it's also a huge financial investment. And I would say that the uh, it, you do see where the money goes. Like the programs that are offered and the caliber of the faculty, including the faculty that may not be on the under the departments. For example, I had a fantastic debate coach and that person probably taught me more about critical thinking than my English teacher. Uh, although I had fantastic English teachers too, but it was just that the way he, I mean, he was just, he'd done it for 30 years and um, used to be a lawyer, was just fabulous. And having someone like that, um, takes money, takes resources. And I think it's also the culture, right? So there's this debate circuit um, among independent schools and all, all sorts of extracurricular activities like Model UN and um, Model Congress have um, specific, nation specific um, competition opportunities. And boarding schools do invest a lot in supporting their students in terms of competing in these um, opportunities. So, you know, Andover has over 100 student-led clubs and organizations. It's a huge school. Some of these are basically small liberal arts colleges. That's one way to think about them. Um, writing and speech, um, I'll just name like at Milton, for example, the student publications they have. They have the Milton paper, a weekly newspaper, the Milton measure, a bi-weekly newspaper, Milton Academy yearbook. Um, they have a literary magazine. They have a French magazine, a Spanish magazine, and a cultural periodical, a science magazine, magazine, uh, one that celebrates diverse cultures, a feminist magazine, an identity quarterly. That's just one school and all of these opportunities, right, for developing um, your writing skills, your editing skills, which really can help you in college. When you enter a top college, you actually have to compete a little in some, in some colleges to get onto the school newspaper. And they actually do look at what you've done in high school. And going to these boarding schools that are well known uh, does give you a bit of a leg up because those uh, editors do recognize those schools. Um, okay, very quickly, a comparison. International schools, with especially with IB and A levels, have a more structured curriculum versus um, the more Western and US centric syllabus that's determined by the teachers and the faculty in boarding schools. More global choices, uh, there are fewer electives, um, and more subject based classes. 
boarding schools in both US and UK has more of a classical emphasis. Greek, Latin are often uh, offerings and uh, Latin is sometimes required, in fact, in UK schools. Um, the foreign language options might be quite different and more limited in international schools, but the Chinese language uh, might be much stronger. And to give you a more specific comparison, you can see that um, in grade 10, you'll probably be doing IGCSE or MYP, final year of MYP. There's also an e-assessment for the MYP that you can take. Um, and then there's um, the junior English for American schools, DP and A-levels for um, schools that follow the IB. And then usually just in the subject of English, you would have AP or senior English. I'm just using English as an example. And then you might have electives as well that are not related to English, but just to say that international schools also have electives. But if you take a look at the boarding school side, there's like a huge range, right? From media studies to Florence and the Medici, which is a course I took and we went to Florence, um, Gothic literature, foundations of contemporary American poetry, discrete mathematics, creative writing, um, techniques of composition and analysis in music, um, computer science algorithm and public policy. And it, for UK schools, they may have more IGCSE subject choices like sociology, marine science, enterprise, food and nutrition, global perspectives, American history, not offered in many IGCSE schools in Hong Kong. For A-levels, they're all, all, same thing. They're also offerings like biblical studies, design and textiles, divinity, classical studies, and so on. Uh, these are just texts to, to show that difference. Uh, with IB schools, um, for English, there would be choices that range from um, uh, Rashomon short stories, Chronicle of a Death Foretold, um, Kafka. But in, on the US side, you on the UK side, you would have more con Western canonical works, like Great Gatsby, uh, the Odyssey, Iliad, Plato, um, reading great classics is part of that um, tradition. And it's also part of the national curriculum. Like for example, having to read Shakespeare or like pre-war and post-World War I, pre, -war, pre and post-World War I poetry, for example. Um, so I would say that to summarize, you have more faculty with advanced degrees, usually about 70%, smaller class sizes, lower teacher-student ratio, sorry, higher, teacher student ratio, I should say. Um, and then you have these uh, advanced courses offered, um, usually 12th grade, lots of electives. And um, you should take a look at the course catalogs and compare. It's very interesting. They are not the same, even among schools that sound interchangeable in the US, there might be areas that your child's interested in that have uh, where some schools have very strong offerings and multiple electives and other schools may have only one or none. Um, and you can check out their percentile on the SSATs and the ACT SATs and check out their faculty profiles. When to transition? So these are some questions to consider. Are they happy? If they're doing very well, if they're super engaged and involved in student government, in service in Hong Kong, it may not be a good idea to uproot your child uh, if they're very happy at home as well. I mean, there's a lot to be said for the relationship, right, with your with yourself and also with your parents, your, their grandparents, their cousins, all of that. I think um, for many people, it can wait. It can wait till college. They're still going to get that global exposure if they go to school abroad in university. And so those are some personal factors to consider. Um, their English proficiency, I mentioned the level of uh, writing in English um, in boarding schools. So if they're not ready, yes, there are boarding schools that offer ESL programs and all of that. But when it comes to the last bit, which is about college admissions, you really want to hit the ground running. You don't want to be there doing an ESL course. Um, that's for, a, I think, a whole different category of people who choose boarding schools for different reasons. Um, and then in terms of, uh, and then of course, their Chinese proficiency and whether you want to um, actually build that up and their connections to this region in Asia. Um, TSA, that's for when you consider transferring from local to international. That's the territory-wide territory, territory -wide school based assessment in Hong Kong, and it's administered in grade three and grade five, and in secondary form three, which is grade nine. So um, a lot of times people apply in grade five, so they don't have to take the, um, it they, they, they doesn't matter what their scores are. So a bit less stress for their child. Um, and then for younger kids, very often it's K3 reception year, um, that they transition. So you actually apply in K2. 
And, um, or you might apply in grade six, year seven. If you're joining an IB school, grade six is the first year of the MYP. So you might want to apply in grade five. Okay, so these are all things that like, you know, we can, we can address one-on-one -on -one or, you know, um, if you come to us and ask us about it as well. Um, and then typically you, you would consider transitioning before high school for international schools these days. Used to be like grade nine was still fine, but I would say these days people usually transfer earlier, partly because of the MYP, but also because um, of the way the world has changed and it's made people reevaluate local schools approach to teaching and the pedagogy. Uh, if it's GC IGCSE, then you would want to enter before grade nine right? Because it's a two-year class, you have to choose your subjects. So year 10 is the first year of IGCSE. It's very confusing, I know, but grade nine in um, the U.S. system is year 10, and that's form three. So you would apply the year before that. A-levels, it's six form entry usually. So uh, someone asked, is, um, is it too late to apply if your child's already 11 years old? Well, you can, it is late if you're trying to get into um, 13 plus because people usually apply uh, when they're nine years old for UK, but um, you can always do sixth form uh, entry. And also if you're going to, uh, we're, we're saying like international versus boarding in our title, but really many people do what I did, right? You go to international school and then you go to a boarding school. So you might also want to go earlier because of that, right? Uh, and then you also want to consider how old, what is the birth date of your child? Um, sometimes when people are in kindergarten, they don't really mind their child skipping a grade or like being the youngest or the oldest. But when you get older, you may like around grade eight is a good time to reevaluate whether your child is in the right grade. Uh, we know there's a lot of research about, um, you know, from Malcolm Gladwell to a lot of uh, developmental research on how boys' executive function skills develop a little bit slower. They do catch up. Um, but if they're already young for their age, uh, you may want to consider repeating grade nine. But that really just depends on the academic abilities of the child, the confidence, uh, also their physical, their physical size, right? Because if you want to compete in sports, that's something to think about, too, um, if you're younger it may not to be, be to your advantage. Um, this is not a college admissions talk, so I will just let you read that. You can take a screenshot. I'm just looking at the time um, if you want, but it ranges from your transcript, which is the most important thing, to your personal qualities, how you can contribute to the college itself, um, and showing service, leadership, and the X factor, which could be the impression that the interviewer has of you when you um, when you speak to them. It could be, um, and they could go to bat for you, right, in writing their letter, um, or if it's an admissions officer in the interview. It could be something that you talk about in your essay, a personal adversity that you've overcome, which makes them uh, respect and, and admire what you've overcome and what you have to bring to the community. So all things being equal, they would choose someone um, that has those unique um, personal experiences, right? It might be creativity, it might be a sense of humor. Um, so these are things that are harder to pin down. And with US, the college, the colleges are, um, it's a more holistic review, 360 review. So you can submit portfolios and things like that. UK, it's more cut and dry, their grades matter the most. So when you're choosing the high school, the secondary school, you do want to think about whether you're planning to go to the US or the UK, right? So you want, if you're going to the UK, um, a school where academically you can perform well would be a good choice. So if you're not a very well-rounded academic performer, you may be very, your child might be very, very intelligent and very motivated and passionate about say STEM subjects or, or creative arts, but not other subjects. IB may not be the best fit Right. So going to a boarding school that does A-levels might show off their talents more and make them more competitive when it comes to applying for UK universities. But for um, um, US, you are thinking about the place, a secondary school that gives them maximum opportunities to develop their extracurricular activities alongside their academics. Uh, these are, again, some numbers. You can definitely go on websites to look at it, but it gives you a sense of um, where we're at in terms of admissions. Um, HGAS has closer to like high upper hundreds, closer to 200 in their graduating class. The size of the college counseling teams are usually different as well. Um, boarding schools usually have more 
college counselors. So the ratio is lower. They have more time and energy to get to know their students. They're, it's, a, it's a boarding school, usually called prep school. So they're designed to prepare people for college. And so um, a lot of the things that, um, that you go through in a boarding school already prepares you for college, but then they also explicitly uh, get you to do surveys, like to understand yourself, uh, everything from interest inventories to teaching how to write um, your resume, resume workshops, things like that, that really help you with your applications. Um, but these are stats for international schools versus, uh, say, a boarding school like Groton. And you can see the differences there. So a lot fewer students apply to U.S. schools in the U.K., even though it's increased. Uh, it's usually about like 5%. And so the numbers uh, are really, it's like a handful of students that get into Ivy League schools each year. Um, but so boarding schools in the U.S. do a lot better. But then again, it's a handful of people who get into Oxbridge each year from a, a U.S. school, right? And um, a lot more who get in close to like, say, 20% um, for selective schools might get into Oxbridge for the very, very selective schools. Um, but a very large percentage would get into a Russell Group University. Um, so which path will help my child get into a better college? We really can't live two lives, so you can never do an experiment. But I would say that given the fact that for the US, it's about academics, extracurriculars, having passion, showing initiative and individuality, um, boarding schools may offer more freedom and more opportunities and facilities for that. Um, and so that's something to think about, but you have to have that whole context of wh whether they're ready to take advantage of these opportunities, whether they're ready for the level of competition. Because if you get into a very selective boarding school and you don't rank very high academically or extracurricularly in terms of sports, music, and all of that, it may not be to your advantage to go. Um, and that's something I think more parents are aware of these days because the level of competition in boarding schools is extremely high. It is global, creme de la creme. And um, when it comes to as college applications, they really, universities can't take that many students from any one school. So um, even if your child scored exact had the same transcript um, in two different schools. The one where they're ranked higher would make them look better, of course, and the counselors and the teachers would be able to speak to that. So you should also look at opportunities to develop new interests, right? And the um, depth of experience of the counseling, the university counseling team. Uh, you can always ask for the matriculation results um, and looking at like what I was saying, the class standing matters a lot. So I would say that um, all the things I've already discussed really, um, put that into the context of what colleges are looking for and how which environment would be able to nurture your child better, given what you know about your child and their level of confidence and um, maturity. All right, so last slide. Um, aside for the, from the academics, think a bit about which school and this could be not just international versus boarding, but really among the boarding schools, which school would help your child cultivate their specific strengths, interests, and passions. I really like how UK boarding schools have experience days, especially for girls schools for some reason. Um, and you basically would go there the year before applying and uh, get, to get, get a taste of life. It helps them choose their students, but it also helps your child figure out uh, whether they like the culture of the school and what the dorms look like. And um, some are mixed age, mixed, mixed grades, some are not. Uh, what are the faculty like? Um, that I think is something that uh, if you get to go, really makes a difference. But even if it doesn't, do a bit more research. Don't just go with brand names and go, okay, well, a lot of people apply there, so it must be a good fit for my child. Definitely not true. Um, and the more you can have this done by your child, the better. By the time your child's in grade eight or grade seven, they're probably better than you are at in terms of like internet search. So you, but what you can provide is like, you know, an Excel sheet or comparison table, or just be a sounding board, right? In terms of having conversations and asking them questions so that they think about different facets to compare. Um, and I think sometimes you have to wait till they're ready for those questions though. So it's not really, it doesn't make sense. We do get people come to us in grade five, talking about US boarding schools, 
it makes sense if you're going to the UK, but not for the US. Uh, if you ask kids too early, it might lead them to not want to go in the end. Um, and so do bear in mind this holistic picture of the academics, the extracurricular offerings, which include sports, performing arts, um, and things like debate and model UN and student government service, and then the personal attributes and strengths and personality of your child and your, your own family. So um, sorry, that was like a lot of information and I've gone overboard, but I, I just wanted to share with you all the information um, that we have. And of course, if you're able to work with us one-on-one, -on -one, we're able to offer a lot more um, specific uh, advice. And these are things that we do at Baker and Bloom, personal statement, um, school selection, interview prep, um, all of these you can do just in and of itself. We also have a complete admissions program where we support you with all of it. Uh, the portfolio creation part, I think, is especially fun and exciting because those are that's one area where sometimes boarding schools might give more support on, and it's more common to do that. But in international schools, you can't solely sometimes rely on the school's resources because teachers are super stretched and busy um, and may or may not be able to support you. So that's something that um, I'm very happy to say we do a great job providing. This is Karen, um, and she's had over seven years of experience as an admissions co uh, consultant and counselor for both boarding and U.S. schools. A lot of people who work with Karen in boarding school stay with her to go on to apply to college um, as well. And she's an alumna of Taft, uh, the boarding school in the US, and also of Harvard College, where we met, uh, and we actually taught together there, uh, and then also Harvard Business School. And she's helped many students get into their top choice US boarding school. She does focus on the US uh, more than the UK. Although these days, if we do complete admissions programs, of course, we also uh, cover UK schools. Um, so these are some of the schools her students have gone to and uh, many more. Um, Karen majored in psychology and she's the most patient counselor you can ask for. Uh, and also, as I said, an admissions counselor is not just someone who helps you jump through the hoops. It's really someone who's there to support your child and help them become more independent. So getting to teach them how to reflect and know themselves better, especially for teenagers who don't like to talk to their parents, it might be helpful. Uh, on the UK side, we have Rory Riley, and uh, Rory has vast experience, uh, both as a registrar himself for admissions at the King's School, and also uh, advising students as an admissions counselor. He also taught uh, in different, uh, different independent schools in the UK, and, um, is the member of an interview panel um, and uh, has experience with university admissions as well. So we're very happy to have had a longstanding partnership with Rory. He's given talks before and he probably will this school year again, so stay tuned. Um, and it's really great to have someone who is in touch with all the things that are happening because the trends and everything uh, vary year to year. So. Um, there are things, the UK boarding school system and missions process is quite hard to navigate because every school has their own pre-test um, or whether they have a pre-test or not, then school, school specific tests, the timeline is different. Um, so that's like, even though in a way the UK boarding school admissions is quite straightforward, that part of managing the calendar and knowing what tests to prepare for can be quite complicated. And Rory is great at that. But also, um, sometimes schools will have places last minute. And many people normally, I mean, they're not going to put it on their website. So if you have someone who is in touch with all the registrars, uh, he will know and be able to place your child last minute. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, preparing for college, not just boarding schools or, in, or secondary school, involves writing, learning how to read and write. We feel that that is one of the strongest gifts that you can give your child in an education to teach them the art of rhetoric, art of communication. Uh, and so this is one area that Baker and Bloom has really focused on, developing a fantastic balanced literacy curriculum from kindergarten through grade six, and then onwards with academic writing, and then more subject specific um, coaching in the upper secondary years. And you can feel free to scan this code to learn more or just go to our website. Um, and our next module begins October 25th. 
Uh, this is our contact information, which you can also find on our website. Do check out our YouTube page because um, there are a lot of recordings from like highlight reels from our previous talks and seminars. Uh, I will skip these questions and uh, you can ask me your own if you're still here. Um, and oops, sorry. And I'll leave this on, on the page. Um, in case you want more personalized advice for your child or an intro meeting with us, just to get a sense of the timeline, whether your child's ready or not, uh, or if you have more specific questions that we don't get a chance to answer today, please feel free to contact us and reach out. We would love to meet you one-on-one. -on -one. It's something that both Karen and I enjoy very much. So um, yeah, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And uh, I'm happy to stay for questions, but if you have to go to lunch, we completely understand. And thank you for your time. If anyone has questions, um, Shireen, you can help facilitate or uh, you can just unmute and um, we can we can answer those questions. No questions? I did have some questions. Um, I think that most I basically in, I hope that in my presentation I've answered a lot of them. A lot of them were about timing and reasons for changing. If anyone wants to learn more about the scholarship aspect of things, um, I'm very happy to share about that as well. Oh, actually, I have a question. Sure. Hi, I don't know who's speaking. Hello? So. Hi, I can hear you. Is it Charmaine or Amber? I'm sorry, I can't tell who's muted and unmuted. So, hello? Go ahead. Hi, Charmaine, you can ask your question. Oh yes, hi, hi. Um, I wanted to ask um, in regards specifically to GSIS. Um, uh, I, I was just wondering, because each class has very few people. It's probably around 70 people. And um, I know the sort of admissions Admit, admissions process is actually quite stringent as well. So would you recommend, because my younger one, she's in currently in uh, P5, grade five, and um, she would be applying for year seven this year. So, um, and I, I, and they wrote to me that there's like a new, new class starting. So there are probably around 27 spaces freeing up. Whereas like for the sort of the older years, I think they don't have as many spaces opening up. So I was, I was just wondering if, because um, we're deciding whether it's the right time to apply. And for this specific school, they, you know, if you apply, um, let's just say you applied this year and if you cannot get in, you have to wait two years before you can apply. But I was yeah. just wondering if, if it's a good year to apply now or? Yeah, I mean, I think that we we are aware, all of us, that um, even international schools that used to be very competitive have lost a lot of students. Um, so I think, especially for older years, there are spaces in terms of high school. Um, at the same time, schools, have, schools are also very adaptive, right? They've responded by accepting more students from local schools and adding on, say, ESL programs and things like that. So the, the composition of the students may have changed a little bit. So in some ways, they're not really, they're not like... Um, they're not like worried about having students fill the seats, but in terms of like, the students that they may want, uh, that they may in the past, like sort of pursued themselves, um, that they may be fewer students applying. So in that sense, if you want to wait, I, I think that you still there would still be places later on, although you would have to consider uh, what it'd be like for your child to stay two more years in whatever school they're in now. Um, I assume it's a local school. And so if that's the case, oh, it may not be actually, because I also have students switching from like Singapore International School or, you know, other international schools to GSIS. So, um, but if they're happy at their primary school and they want to complete that journey, uh, whether it's till grade six or, or grade five, um, I think that you may also want to consider that. So if they're doing well and thriving, I think that there, there's definitely 
no harm in having that extra year of Chinese or extra two years of Chinese. Um, and also, I want to say that uh, this talk wasn't about that, but local schools do a great job developing musical talent. Um, and so it depends. I, I don't know enough about your child's other like non-academic abilities to say. Um, however, I will say that um, German Swiss, while small, has a very strong reputation academically. It's, it does attract more academically inclined students. I think that the, the culture is really nurturing and um, lovely, lovely students who go there. Um, I've done also like PD workshops there and met teachers there. I think they're, they have very devoted staff and faculty. Um, and so I'd say that, you know, that's a great environment to learn in. So if you're, if you're, um, da your daughter, right? If your daughter is like eager to participate in that, I don't know if she's been to any type of summer school in an international school before. That's one way to find out. Um, but what I was trying to say is that even though it's small, in terms of its college admis admissions and matriculation, it does very well. So it kind of punches above its weight. So I feel uh, in that sense, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss GSIS just because it's uh, smaller than the other schools. What that does mean though, is in terms of certain opportunities, um, extracurricular opportunities, there may be fewer offerings, but for what it offers, there are fewer people seeking leadership positions and things like that. So you may also be have a higher level of engagement and leadership uh, in a smaller school, which is true of all small schools, right? So they may not be able to offer in terms of facilities and um, range of activities as much, but in terms of personalized attention and also um, having, you know, it's kind of the big fish, small pond idea. Um, GSIS is a great example of that. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry I to interrupt, Renee. Um, no, this is Jessica. I'm the CEO of Baker and Bloom. Hi, and Jessica. because, like, yeah, hi. So just wanted to add a little bit to this question because we get actually the most requests to go into GSIS, uh, even more so than CIS and HKS uh, in the past few years. So we do have some experience in this uh, area. And what we have uh, seen the trend is um, a, a lot of the uh, students who come to us, uh, they're actually offered another chance to uh, uh, um, try again if they do not get in the first year, in the second year. Uh, usually because they have legacy or they have another sibling in GSIS. And if that's the case, because the, the as you mentioned, most of uh, uh, like the usual practice in GSIS is if you fail to enter in the first round, like, I mean, the first time you try, you cannot try again in two years. But we've seen some exceptions given uh, uh, in these two years. I don't know if it's because of um, lower enrollment, or, uh, but I think it definitely has something to do with legacy and also uh, um, siblings being in there. And we've helped a lot of students get into GSIS just uh, these uh, uh, in, in the past five years. And what we've seen, in, if, you, if they usually cannot get in the first time, uh, after they uh, stay with us for one year, they can join in the second time. Uh, potentially, of course, because we also try to help them uh, 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 improve their scores and uh, familiarize them with the exams more. But also, it might show, as what Renee said, uh, uh, that there might be more openings. Uh, but GSIS has a reputation um, uh, that you must be very strong academically, and you must do very well in the entrance exams to get in, regardless of maybe uh, some other like uh, um, legacy. What we've seen uh, um, students who've uh, uh, whose older siblings that we got we tried we we got into GSIS, and the younger ones can get in. So legacy and also connection does not play as big of a factor in GSIS than uh, compared to what, uh, how strong your academic standing is. Uh, but uh, with the recent uh, years of uh, college admission um, record in GSIS, we've seen a, 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 a surge of people wanting to go, go in there. Uh, uh, so um, as an option um, besides CIS and HCAS, the, the, the common ones that people come to us for. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that, that even if you don't get in the first time, uh, uh, we, we have helped students get in the second time. Um, and sometimes the, 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 the school will grant exceptions to let you do the exam 
earlier than two years. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. Um, Irene, you had a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Renee. I'd like to ask if I have a child, uh, 12 years old, uh, keen, very keen swimmer, and also play instrument at very advanced level. Um, does that, uh, in general, will be better suited for her to attend US boarding school as opposed to UK boarding school? Um, do you see a trend that the, the UK boarding school um, allowing for um, more focused training? Because I understand in the UK boarding school, they might give you a variety of sports, but at the same time, if my child already, you know, already very much into swimming, um, yeah. then Did what, you what is your- You said swimming and music? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. playing an instrument. Uh, she's also a student at the um, APA junior music program. So she goes there every Saturday. It, it's a bit like the Juilliard uh, yeah, Saturday I, I, program. I'm familiar with the program. The AP yeah. the Dean of Music is an advisor of our school, uh, Sharon Schwab. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I know about that amazing program. Yes. Um, so um, Thank you. I would say that, no, you, you're welcome. Um, swimming is a sport in almost every boarding school. And uh, we've worked with people who have been recruited. We've worked with people who are just uh, very competitive. And so and if... The, the cr crux of the matter is whether you want to apply to the US or the UK. If it is the US, I would say that it makes more sense to go to the US in this case, because it is a sport that is uh, very common. So you have more choices with boarding schools. Um, of course, some schools have stronger uh, swim teams, and that's something to take, pay attention to. Um, it is also the case that boarding schools in the U.S. have very strong music. I, I would say that there that's about that one is about equal. Like UK has amazing um, tradition of music um, instruction as well. Mm -hmm. And even when it was during COVID times, places mm -hmm. like Wickham Abbey offered individualized online instruction that was incredible. Um, mm -hmm. But having said that, you you're not at a disadvantage. So overall, U.S. would mm -hmm. probably be the better better package i guess um mm -hmm. and i don't know about academics but it's also there's there's kind of more choices there uh so that's only mm -hmm. if you're going to the us though right because if you're going to the uk um they're not there to to i mean it's, it's there it's a system designed to put you into good uk university not a us mm -hmm. university. so of mm -hmm. course the emphasis on um at extracurriculars is a bit more traditional uk approach mm -hmm. uh which mm -hmm. might be as something to be a more a way to be a more well-rounded person, which is something mm -hmm. that's very, you know, in these in this day of like hyper competitiveness, it's rather refreshing. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've gone back and forth. Like in the past, I sort of felt like, oh, you know, in the UK, they don't really prepare you enough for competitive yeah. US college extracurricularly. And then now I feel like the US schools have gone like, whoa, over like, the board. You know, yeah. it, it's yeah. like be professional to the degree where yeah, yeah. I'm not sure on the mental, I didn't mention this, but I, I have a list of drawbacks as well for you yeah. for boarding schools and mental health is actually one of them. Um, and so yeah. that I kind of heard the same as well. And I, my experience is also sometimes the US college application is taking that extra curricular activities a bit over the board. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's still up to you, right? It's still yeah. up to you. And that's where hopefully if we are working together or just, I mean, you advising your child, have, have a bit more focus when you navigate mm -hmm. the secondary mm -hmm. years. But don't spread yourself too thin. Uh, I think yeah. that's more now a danger of that than, than the reverse, where in the past it's like, oh, go do more, try new things, get out of your comfort zone. Now people are just like, I'm doing 10 things. And yeah. none of them very well and super, super stressed out. And because of extracurricular, especially swimming, I have to say, it's a very demanding sport. They may not have a lot of time for academics mm -hmm. because of swimming. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you do swimming, you might do water polo, but maybe not. You, you probably don't need you to be a tri-varsity athlete. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I understand. Thank you. Very sure. helpful. Hi, Lisa. I think um, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm actually Lisa's husband. Oh. So basically, okay, basically my son, uh, he is now currently enrolling in CIS. Uh, he is now in the uh, uh, year nine, but we all know it's like grade eight, right? But they call it year nine. Yep. So the yep. question, I'm in a dilemma to the fact that I'm applying for him for like a first tier and second tier boarding school in the US. We would definitely go to US eventually. The question that I have is, if he cannot 
make it to the first tier U.S. boarding school, do you think is it worth it for him to stay on to go to Hangzhou? Because, you know, we heard different feedback about like the Hangzhou program. Some said it's good. Some said it's like a year of partying and stuff like that. Like, you know, so I don't know whether he should stay on to the CIS, to the Hangzhou, if he cannot make it to the first tier boarding school or he should just go ahead to the second tier. You know what I mean, right? Yes. Yep. So if you can, so, well, I mean, Generally, we don't tier schools, but using your, your terminology, if your child doesn't get into the so-called first tier schools, that would mean, though, that academically, they may not be super, uh, like, prepared, even for IB, right? Because it's not like CIS doesn't have strong academics either in terms of how the students overall perform. And staying at CIS would mean completing the diploma program. It doesn't right now have an alternative. So my thought there is that actually, if they're not able to get into a very competitive um, UK, US school, but they are in a school that you're also happy with, because I, I presume you're applying to the tier two school because you also like that school. Um, that may be a good choice in that if they have a chance of a different environment where they can academically grow and have those opportunities uh, that we talked about that boarding schools offer, um, that may be good for your child. Having said that, a lot depends on your feelings about how much you want your child to have that connection with China, Chinese culture, Chinese language, um, and also how much your child likes CIS and his classmates. And everything that you hear about the CIS Hangzhou is probably true in that I have met students who partied really hard, had a great year, uh, and then came back and had to catch up, but they still caught up, you know. And then there are people who, who went there and like got so much out of it. A um, lot of service opportunities that are very interesting in that Hangzhou year. Um, and What's true, though, is I would not compare that experience to boarding school experience directly because parents come all the time. They go home all the time. So it's not like a continuous, you know, really study abroad for a whole year. Although these days with the with, before we've tongue one, I don't know, maybe maybe it is more like boarding school because the parents can't go if they're in Hangzhou. Um, but in the past, I would say that it was much more of a like you know, the connection to Hong Kong is still very, very strong. Yeah, see, so, see the thing is, sorry, sorry. One thing I forgot to highlight is, because ultimately, because what I heard so much about is, you know, it would be better for him to actually, you know, go for the high, like say grade 10 or 11, like to actually come out from the U.S. high school, shoot, you know, he would have a better chance to go to a U.S. college, a good U.S. college versus stay on. I think there are two things to think about. To finish the high, uh, his high school in the in uh, CIS, you know, so that's why ultimately, you know, he would go. Um, I can't hear the rest of your sentence, but I think I actually happen to use CIS statistics and to compare with Groton, which is a much, which is a very small school. Um, and there are a lot more people going from Groton to top tier um, Ivy League plus schools than CIS. But that's right. not to say, I mean, that's like a very, like I said, like just one dimension of analyzing a school. Um, but if you're looking at sheer numbers and if you're able to get in and to do like, let's say top, 25% of your class, um, the chances of you getting into a good school just from a sheer numbers point of view is obviously higher and uh, in the US boarding school. Um, but, for, but I think what also matters a lot is that when you go to a US boarding school, you realize that there's so many good universities in the US. That in mm. Hong Kong, when you're in Hong Kong, you sort of just hear a few names, like, you know, two dozen schools, but really, Smaller arts colleges that are less well known here, but very, very well known in the US, uh, offer an excellent education that then can lead to graduate programs uh, in the more globally recognized um, universities. And that's definitely not a bad path at, at all, right? Uh, whereas if you stay in CIS, very often I see people, their backup plan is like UK, right? And, um, and I'm not sure that's like necessarily better than going to a uh, less well-known U.S. college um, that might be a better fit in terms of academics and so on for your child. So going to a uh, U.S. boarding school, regardless of its so-called ranking, I think has 
uh, a certain exposure and preparation, um, which can be very beneficial and make your child naturally more competitive um, in that sense. Academically, I'd be globally recognized. So, and CIS in the final years, extremely competitive academically. So I would not say that it's easy to stay at CIS. I guess that was my point. It seems like there were three choices, right? There A was tier one US, B was tier two US, C was staying in CIS, not just Hangzhou, but but for um, many years, right? Till the end. So I would say that it, it's not, it seems like it's not just IB versus super competitive uh, boarding school. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, this is Gail. Can I um, ask you your advice or your thoughts on something? Sure. Yeah, I have um, two children. I'm struggling um, whether to send them to the U.S. or U.K. boarding school. Um, the U.S., it seems as if, you know, the, the requirements are more um, challenging in that, you know, in, on top of academics, they look at um, other factors as well. But you mentioned something in passing just now, I didn't really catch it, something about uh, grade nine repeat. So for my daughter, she's in grade eight right now. She's in an international school, um, CDNS. Um, and I'm just wondering if what your thoughts are on, because I'm so late already on this application process of this grade nine repeat. I think you mentioned something about that, but I didn't catch it. I think it was just really yeah, quickly yeah, yeah. and you did it in passing. Okay, so sorry, just re to repeat, your child is already in grade nine? No, she's in grade eight. No, sorry, she's in grade eight, okay. Um, so what I was saying is that it in the past, you were you usually applied for grade nine in grade eight. And now um, there are more people who might stay for grade nine in their international schools in Hong Kong. So your, your, your uh, daughter might stay uh, for another year and then apply in grade nine for grade nine. Apply at, okay, so apply, okay. So for a grade nine repeat at one of these um, US boarding schools, one of the senior um, boarding schools, right? Yes. The US, okay. Yes. Um, and in the UK, you have sixth form. So you, you don't have to, especially for girls, um, you can do sixth form. So you don't have to rush if you if you want to keep your daughter close to, close, um, to you for a bit longer. Um, and it, I don't think it's too late. Like I said, another thing I said in the very beginning was that I applied um, in grade nine for grade 10. So um, most schools accept like about close to 100 kids um, for their first year intake, grade nine, and um, they, they might accept another 60 uh, fewer in the second year. So it is slightly more competitive, well, more than slightly more competitive in grade 10. Um, usually you have to be academically a bit stronger because they're, they, the schools wanna do well too with college admissions. So they're also trying to make sure that you're gonna transition quickly. Um, so if you apply grade nine, you have a choice. You can apply grade nine for grade nine or grade nine for grade 10. But I would definitely look at the birth date because it does make a difference like in terms of maturity, um, your actual age. I find now that I'm running a school, I find that it's really quite all over the map. Like you have people with the same birthdays essentially in different grades and neither, neither student's family feels that they held them behind or skipped a grade. Like maybe in their school, it was quite normal or because of a sibling and they just felt like um, that's that's normal. Like I have two kids, one's six, one's four. They're, so they're 19, they're 20, I forget, like 19, 20 months apart. Um, and they're only one year apart academically. So that's also like, so then I may have an option later on for my younger one to repeat a grade. Uh, but right now he's doing fine and he, he likes where he's at. So I mean, He's in kindergarten. So like, there's no need to really switch anything, but right. I'm just saying that like the, the date of birth is something that uh, you may, that gives you, that can give you more latitude depending on how old they are. Okay, so for my daughter, she's, she was born in uh, 2009, January. Okay, January, yeah. So I, I think basically you, you have to do the math um, to figure out whether they're, is she, is she old or well, she's probably um, middle of the pack actually, if she's January. Um, yeah, so middle, yeah. In, in terms of swim, um, in sorry, not swim, in terms of sports, um, that's something to think about. If she's really into sports, like it does, it's like red shirting, right? Like holding them back a year uh, makes mm -hmm. sense. I do really see more boys do it than girls. 
Um, okay. And I, I think it's because girls generally are mature enough to, to make that leap. Um, and so most parents are like, well, I don't exactly, there's no reason to repeat a year just for the sake of repeating a year, right? So um, if they can, then I think it's fine to stretch them a bit and to just, just go, right? But if they can, not then you still have the option of repeating a year. And sometimes you don't have to make that decision. You can just apply and talk to the admissions office or they might decide for you where they okay. see the child fit in. Um, I think I'll take two more questions. I don't know, I see Thank one. You. Mm -hmm. No, you're very welcome. Um, and a question was uh, from a financial perspective, would it cost pretty much the same to finish IB at a private school in Hong Kong uh, versus a, a boarding, uh, boarding school in the US? Uh, sorry, I just wanna say this slide, I just wanted to show you guys because it seems to be a bit of a question about um, US, UK, just to see the destinations, right? The percentage, I hope that's pretty clear. Um, and in terms of US destination, usually it's no more than 5% of the student population. Um, so these are just examples. Okay, so I will go back to answer your question to a very early slide. Sorry for this super long presentation, but um, it was on uh, tuition. Did I, oops, this is not, yeah, here. So you can take a look here, right? I mean, you do kind of, I don't know how old your child is, so it does depend how many more years there is to go. Um, but I have to say that boarding schools are expensive, not just because of the tuition, but the flight tickets, right? So like you fly there, they fly there, uh, they fly back and that adds up um, as well. Of course, uh, like I said, international schools have another hidden cost, which is the debenture or the capital note. So some are refundable, some are non-refundable. Make sure you know which you're getting yourself into uh, when you make that comparison. Um, and so uh, US boarding schools, you were, that's what you, uh, the, the person who asked. asked. Um, so these are all good US boarding schools and you can see it's in the 550 range, 500 to 550 range. Um, so it's pretty hefty, a price tag, yeah. So more likely to cost more, I would say, to go to a US school. Um, okay, last question was, do you mind sharing the international school matriculation, the slide before the Groton one? Okay, yes, sure. Um, Oopsie, oh, I'm sorry, let's see this. Yes. HKS and CIS uh, do very well. So um, German Swiss, again, for its size does really well, but I think that the ones to look at would be the HKS one and the CIS ones. Um, so you can see that um, most of them, 40% end up in the US and in uh, HKS, it's like 90% in the US. Actually, no, it says on the slide, it's 80% that goes to US. So they do have students that go to like um, Europe, that go to uh, France, for example, or England. And then there's a good number that goes to like um, Canada, um, that goes to uh, their home country, which might be like Singapore or Korea as well. So usually there are a handful of kids that do that. And again, this is not a college admissions talk, but then we can get into the whole like deferral and things like that as well. Um, Okay, I hope that answers most of your questions. And maybe part of what I'm here to say is that a lot of this information you can seek on your own. So it's really not just the facts that I hope I've, we've shared today, but the perspectives of um, how students feel. Many students that go to boarding school feel like it transformed their life and prepared them so well for college, not just academically, but also in terms of extracurricular and personal maturity and confidence. Um, and international schools, I think that a huge advantage is really the relationships that I see between the children and their families um, and being able to see their siblings and have that for a bit longer. Right, uh, so that's a huge advantage. And then also all the things that are specific to Hong Kong, um, which are definitely these days, especially when they might come back to settle in Hong Kong, um, should not be dismissed. So 
thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you in person at Baker and Bloom. Do check out our courses and uh, make an appointment to speak to Karen and me uh, in person. Thank you. Bye-bye.